Clearly, when you grab a real coffee cup, you should feel it. However, in VR, there is no haptic feedback, and your finger would go right through the cup. Hopefully, the cup is not too hot. This is called object interpenetration, and it is currently one of the main hurdles in, for realism in VR and in AR, because it, it drastically reduces immersion, and it makes grasping virtual objects difficult. A lot of research has looked at this problem. One approach is to address this issue is to compensate for the problem in software, like on this example. And another approach is to keep the problem from happening in hardware. For that, we can provide the appropriate kinesthetic feedback to the hand to hold it from penetrating through the object. A feedback glove has been developed like the Cybergrass Globe in 2007, which uses cable to block finger's motion. Pneumatic and hydric glove have also been developed, and recently, electric glove based on small motors and tendons, or motors and a, a small exoskeleton, appeared. However, all these solutions are bulky, they use complex mechanisms, they are rather rigid which can restrain movements, and most of the time they feature one size only. Is it what you really want? One way to find out what user want is to go and check on the poor user. Here are some selected comments from a subreddit on VR. This basically gives us a shopping list of the desired property of a VR haptic device. These enthusiasts want to feel object. They want a glove to stop their fingers. They want a soft and flexible glove in a light and thin four factor. And they want one size fit all. So in response to these desired features, we propose Dextress. It is a haptic glove providing kinesthetic and cutaneous feedback. It is flexible with a neutral profile. It is light, less than eight grams per fingers. It is comfortable, it brief, and it is hand size agnostic. So all these points are very important to have a convincing VR experience and even more for AR. So does it work? Of course it does. As many of you uh, saw it yesterday during the demo, I hope so. So this video shows the glove in action. And here, and in the top left is a VR view. So when grasping the green book, uh, the glove activates and stops the finger going through the book, as you can see here. And now the question is, how does it block the fingers? So at the core of our technology is an electrostatic clutch here on the glove. So our electrostatic clutch design is made from simple and robust components, and it is easy to fabricate. It consists of a sandwich of two thin metal strips, and the strips are made of a thin steel shim, only 100 micrometer thick, which makes them flexible. The strips are separated by a very thin electrical insulator, here in yellow, shown in yellow. And the insulator was chosen to be polymid because it has a high electrical breakdown field and it has a high mechanical wear resistance. So how does this block motion? First, we have no voltage applied between the strips, there is no friction and the finger can move freely. However, when applying a high voltage in the strips, the electrode of this variable capacitor are charged up, leading to a very high attractive electrostatic force between the strips. Therefore, the strips are pulled together, and as a result, the friction between the strips increases. Because they cannot slide anymore, the system blocks torques generated at the joints, of the, and the finger is blocked. So using this mechanical, the strip can rapidly squeeze and block movement, as is stated on this animation. And the blocking force is proportional to the surface, to the voltage to the square, and reversely proportional to the distance to the square. So this electrical mechanism allows to block movements on demand without using any electrical motors. So how much run how much force can we block? So we can, an electrostatic clutch is capable of blocking a force of more than two kilograms when applying a high voltage. Which is here around 20 Newton. And in addition, we can disengage very quickly the brake. So now let my colleague Vilko explain its integration and its evaluation. Thanks, Robin. Okay. 
So next I'm going to talk about the challenges we have to solve in order to turn the ES brake into a kinesthetic haptic device that you mount on your hand and that's uh, used in VR. So I'm going to play a video of a participant. This was in uh, last night's demo and what's nice here is that uh, the participant nicely summarizes the challenges that we have to solve in order to turn this ES brake into a kinesthetic haptic device. I don't know if there's going to be sound but hopefully. Okay, there's no sound, but uh, I'll show you what he says after. It's a little bit wonky mounted. Okay, so what he says is uh, he likes the idea of giving haptic feedback rather than removing freedom of movement. So this uh, is basically the core idea. So we want to block finger movement, but we want to keep the hand flexible and moving around. And combining these two things together is actually quite challenging. So. Here's our first shot of making a prototype um, of the haptic, uh, ha of this type of haptic device. And we see here that the, the thin and flexible strips are moving nicely. They're mounted on the hand using 3D printed guides. Um, however, maybe as you watch this video, you can pay attention to how the strips flex and slide. You might be able to notice a couple of problems. So the, the first challenge we have is metacarpal flexion. So when you bend your finger inwards, in the, in the prototype you just saw, there won't be any breaking because this, the strips are actually not sliding over top of each other. So there must be sliding of the strips in order to engage the brake. Next, uh, another problem is to do with hand size. So like we mentioned earlier, we want to be hand size agnostic. And when you place these 3D printed guides on the hand, a person with larger hands or smaller hands, they may displace the guides. Then uh, they may end up in undesirable locations, for example, uh, the knuckle. And this has the effect that uh, the strips become pinched when you flex your finger. And when they become pinched, there's friction and then they can't slide anymore. Next, uh, we have finger abduction, so moving side to side. Um, and what happens when you move side to side? The strips actually flex and they hit against the, these guides. And what this means is that when you then go to flex your finger inwards, uh, there's friction on the sides, of the sides of the guides. So there's friction there. And we're not aiming to actually break this kind of movement. This is a very difficult thing to do. What we just want to do is not restrict your hand from moving this way. So uh, just go back here. Zooming into this guide that's on your, on your hand, um, why not just make it like a huge gap? And then the, the strips would be, e it would be easy for the strips to move inside. So that's one solution. But thinking back to the working principle, if the gap is too big, the, the strips are too far apart, and then they won't engage properly. So. The challenge is, well, what we want to do is make, make the strips as close as, uh, t together as possible, but the challenge is that there's really a trade-off here between flexibility on your hand and having the strips ready to engage at any time. So here's our proposed solution. This is um, kind of a, a 3D diagram of, of your hand. So the first thing that uh, we did is that we moved the anchoring of the strips closer to the back of the hand. And now the strips will slide when you flex your finger inwards, and we will be able to break this movement. This also has kind of like a bonus effect, so uh, we have a large breaking area, which is good for increasing the force we can, the blocking, the blocking force. Next, uh, we have these um, flexible guides, and also we use Velcro to kind of position it individually on a person's hand, and this allows us to account for different hand sizes. And the 3D printed guides themselves that I talked about, they're kind of optimized so that the gap is as small as can be, um, allowing the strips to move inside, but they're not, in, uh, also remain close enough to engage at any time. And finally, we added uh, piezo vibrotactile actuators to the fingertip, and this is in order to communicate touch information when you go to grab an object. So this is mainly for the comparative study. So great, okay, so on the left uh, we have the final integration. You can see how the hand is moving. It seems to be pretty flexible. Um, we have this kinesthetic haptic device on your hand, but what can we do with this? What new things can you actually do with this? When you compare it to the, to the devices on the right, for example. And one of the most common things that you do every day is you, you grab objects, it's performing different types of grasps. You can try this now if you have a bottle, if you have, we can imagine you have a bottle. You can go to unscrew the bottle cap and you might notice that your finger's kind of curled in automatically. And this curling is, is, this type of grasp may be difficult for current exoskeletal devices to support. So what we propose is that we test the device for four different types of grasp. The first is a lateral grasp. This is very difficult. Your thumb is on top and your fingers are curled. 
the precision grasp, like instrument holding, and the power grasp, picking up coffee cups or large objects. And last is the, the parallel grasp. This is like holding a book or your laptop. They're all quite different. They flex the hand quite a bit in different ways. And what we did in our user study is uh, we performed a, a, a user study for VR, for grasping in VR, and we looked at the effect that Dextrous has on precision and realism when performing these grasps in VR. So this is kind of what the setup looks like. For precision, the main metric we looked at was how much, what percentage uh, participants penetrate into virtual objects. And we had 10 participants for this user study. Uh, behind me, you can see here, there's um, kind of a video of the different tasks they're playing. And you'll notice that each task is individually designed. So they're individually designed to match the grasp. And the aim here is that we want to have both uh, hand movement in 3D space and wrist rotations, which make it difficult for your fingers to stay in position unless they are held back. And we have four conditions, um, visual, piezo, clutch, just the break, and both, which is both piezo and clutch together. I don't know if it's, I guess it's finished playing. Okay. And onto the results, we have qualitative. We asked participants which one is the most realistic uh, scenario and um, uh, condition, sorry, and we also asked them how comfortable the device is on their hand and um, does it restrict their hand movement. So we see that overall the glove is quite comfortable and it's not overly restrictive in their movement. And of course they prefer the both condition in terms of realism. To recap, the main metric again for precision was the percentage of penetration into an, a virtual object. So first up we have the pincer grasp. This is the precision grasp. As per the previous paper, this is a very useful grasp in many different, uh, many different instances. Uh, we found that here with both the clutch and the piezo feedback, participants penetrated less into an object as compared to a visual, uh, uh, visual condition. And yes, this is quite promising as this is a very uh, common type of grasp. So. Next we have the power grasp. Here we found that with only the break, without piezo, participants penetrated significantly less than visual. And we hypothesized this uh, is because there's more room for the break, break to engage and more time. Similarly, for the book or parallel grasp, we need both piezo and break for there to be a significant improvement in precision. And finally, this is a, a tricky one. So the, the frisbee or lateral, lateral grasp, we didn't, there was no improvement. But uh, let me just go to the next slide quick. It wasn't that the break wasn't working, but we kind of uh, made it difficult for ourselves. We had a very small object, and the dis distance between the thumb and the fingers is very small. So there basically wasn't enough space for the break to engage. But we have a participant who says, when I got tired, they're basically resting their thumb using the break while it was engaged. So the break does work in this form, uh, in this grasp, just not quickly enough. And just to go back, we support three of the four grasps that we uh, proposed. So at the end of the experiment, uh, we kind of had like a playground where participants could interact with various objects freely. And during these type of freeform interactions, it was really interesting because, you know, in the, in, the, in the test, they were really careful not to penetrate and they were very, very observant. But here they were really just grabbing things quickly. So what happened was that there was actually a, a greater effect of the kinesthetic feedback in this uh, playground. And we think this, this is because they are less careful when they are just quickly handling objects. Um, so here, actually, we have some participant feedback. Unfortunately, there's probably no sound, but I'll kind of tell you what he's saying. So he's interacting with the physics playground, and he's picking up the cube, and he's also making an interesting comment that, so when you pick up an object and you're holding it in your hand and you go to rotate your wrist, it's actually restrictive kind of on your forearm. And this kind of thing, this kind of feeling only happens when you have real kinesthetic feedback in your hand. You can try it yourself. If you're holding an object, kind of rotate, and you'll feel that your, your forearm is engaged, basically. This would be what he has to say, but we have no sound. So overall, um, I want to also discuss some limitations in future work. Uh, the device that we presented in the paper had a, a high voltage requirement. It required 1.5 kilovolts, uh, which is quite a lot. Still low power, but 1.5 kilovolts. And by using different materials, we are able to reduce this voltage to 200 and double the force. So the, the, the device you tried out yesterday is the new device. This is a 10 times efficiency improvement. So we kind of scratched this one off the list, we think. And then the next thing is fitting. Uh, 
Although we can fit to different hand sizes, it's still a time-consuming task. We're working on solutions that can accelerate this process. And finally, uh, it would be great if you could not just stop a person's fingers, but also pull back on their, on their fingers. And what this could enable is like objects with different stiffnesses, like balls, and just generally more realistic interactions. That's, uh, that's about it for the talk. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we're happy to take some questions. Thank you. Wow, we have a question. Right, Pedro Lopez, University of Chicago. This is really cool. Congratulations. I tried it yesterday, and it works flawlessly. I was hoping that you would also show a video of the person in the physics playground touching the croissant. How does it feel on soft objects? I guess one of the hard things is how do you switch it on and off to like multiple stages of softness? Yes, that's very good. This one. Okay, yeah, this is a great question. We actually kind of cut the presentation down a bit, but we're prepared for this question. This is awesome. um, varying the voltage mm -hmm. allows you to actually render different levels of resistance on your fingers, right? So mm -hmm. we can't push your fingers back, but we can render different levels of resistance. We actually did do a study on this in the paper, and we found that kind of uh, in the middle range, let me see if it's actually showing, whoops, uh, in the middle range uh, of the, the voltage that you can actually sense up to 5% different uh, levels of stiff or deformation on mm -hmm. an object. So it's possible to do this, and it would be great to explore this further. Thank I you. I think you should totally do it, because this is a kind of a new way to like render that stiffness yeah. without so much force, probably. Yeah. Awesome work. Thank you. Jackie. OK. Um, so I noticed that uh, you, you said that in the Frisbee or plate kind of scenario, uh, the controller doesn't work as well as the other three. Um, I imagine, could it be like, um, so like if you're gripping, gripping like this, I guess you're only breaking your thumb, not the, the other finger, right? That's, that's correct, yes. And uh, I feel like, like for, for, for my hands, I, I think for most people's hands, like the, the other finger can also move up and down. Is it because like the other, the, the other finger is moving because you cannot break in that direction? Do you think that's an issue? So, yeah, so you're asking kind of about finger abduction together with thumb yes. breaking this way. Yeah, so this th thumb flexion. And this, this we discussed in the, in the, uh, the overall abduction slide. This, this is something we don't restrict, but we can't break yet. Because in actuality, the distance is very, very small. Right, right, right. And to engage the brake properly in such a small distance is a very, very tricky thing. So, right, right. so do, you have, do, do you imagine in the future, if you change how the device works, could it break in that direction? I think that would be, I mean, any device in the future that ideal, renders everything in an ideal way, you definitely would want this feature. So okay. yeah, we can try to work towards that. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Dan Ashbrook, University of Copenhagen. You mentioned um, that your device is basically forming a variable capacitor. So I'm wondering if you can use this actually as a sensor as well to sense position of bend. Uh, yes, technically. It it's possible to use sensors, but for now we didn't have the time and we didn't finish to integrate this. Basically, if you measure the capacitance, yeah, you can you can know how, how much you stretch the device. After, for now, you have the movement of the hand, so you have to adapt uh, probably the sensor on the hand of the user. It should be possible. Cool. Thanks. I'll ask a final question. Um, so when I tried this out, I really liked it, and I really liked the solution around how you basically don't make me feel the, 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 the bendable interface around my knuckles very much, which was an obvious limitation of previous interfaces. Um, but uh, you know, sort of coming from the, from the controller corner, right, where we explored exactly that with the controller form factor, what are the fundamental uh, uh, differences and advantages of this approach, like even if you extrapolate to five fingers, right? Do you, do you see any like, clear advantages? I, I don't know if you got a chance to try our demos at Kai. Um, OK, no worries. Um, OK, so compare our device to controllers. Mm -hmm. um, I think both ways have advantages. Of course, the main advantage of a controller is that you can pick it up quickly and use it, use it quickly. And uh, we had some participants yesterday that didn't want to use a glove because it's annoying to put on and so on. So moving kind of both devices in the same direction, <clears throat> you can have a glove that's faster to put on, maybe not covering the entire hand. Um, and another thing is that I think you would want um, for example, an AR, you want something that doesn't uh, that keeps your hand free to interact with objects, real-world objects. So the adv one advantage of such a device is that you can continue interacting with the real world. 
I, so the reason I asked this yeah. question is that I, what I like most about this design is how minimal it is compared mm -hmm. to previous work, right. which makes me wonder, do you even need the glove? Right? Do you need the, the, like the white material there, or could it be really, really sparse in how you put it on? This, the, yeah, this is actually a great uh, future direction. So it, cutting it down to only the most necessary parts and kind of putting it on the hand like a controller that you can just put it, slap it on, that would be the best. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. Okay, okay let's thank the speakers again.